This is the second class in the series on the Red Heifer Ritual. We are addressing the necessary why questions that define our Heavenly Father's motivations. The answers to these why questions will take the light out of the darkness concerning the eternal truths and principles of our Creator being radiated through this ritual. So the next question in our list is about touching. That merely touching the dead assigns such a serious defilement that one has to remove themselves from the community for seven days and participate in two sin offerings or leave the community forever. So the question is, why? Why is touching the avenue of defilement? We read in Numbers 19 and verse 16, And whosoever touches one that is slain with a sword in the open field, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean seven days. We, re we probably recall the warnings about the contagious nature of the touch of an unclean person. Whatever that unclean person touches becomes a new uncleanness host. And anything touching that new uncleanness host actually becomes a new uncleanness host. This is exactly the same way that disease is transmitted. A person with the flu or cold can transmit the disease by leaving the disease-carrying microorganisms on door handles or any shared surface. This is a creational feature under the curse of sin and death. Surgeons only started scrubbing between surgeries in the late 19th century after the microscope was invented. And this disease-laden bacteria could be seen. All of a sudden, the death rate in hospitals plummeted when surgeons actually started washing between surgeries, respecting the principle of uncleanness contagiousness testified to by the laws of the First Kingdom Age. One should legitimately wonder why any professed Bible believer would ever think that disease would not be passed by touch if there were no cleansing. Science finally caught up with Bible truths, but about 3,500 years later than it should have. I guess exclusively scientific thinkers are pretty slow learners. Death by touch was a highly emphasized lesson of the Mosaic Covenant, which focused on personal works as well as divine judgment. That covenant at Mount Sinai was also marked by a death touch. We quote from Exodus 19, verse 13. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come up to the mount. This covenant was based on works. This covenant magnified sin and schoolmastered us to Christ in desperate need of an unattainable self-justification. It demonstrated we could not justify ourselves no matter how hard we tried. It was perfect symmetry. That touching this very Mount Sinai where the vileness of sin and our incapacity to live without sin was being spotlighted and would mean certain death for man and beast. And now we should note the death judgment on beasts as well. An animal would know nothing of this warning, but that would not prevent their death due to physical contact with the mountain. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Eve explains to us the divine command was not simply to avoid eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Merely touching that tree would result in death being imposed upon all of creation, man and beast. We read from Genesis 3 and 3, where she says, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Let's keep in mind this testimony is offered at a point when Eve was still innocent and incapable of guile or intentional deceit. Therefore, we are not free to ignore her testimony about the death by touch injunction. Death could never have been part of of the creation order prior to the introduction of sin, as we're specifically told at the conclusion of the six days of creative activity that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, 
It was very good. Well, there's no possible way. Death could be included in anything our Creator declares to be very good. By his laws, merely touching the dead meant a seven-day defilement. Even Jesus, as a mortal, refused even the lesser title of good from the rich young ruler who, who addressed him as good master. Undoubtedly, Jesus has been the best component in creation since creation was corrupted by sin. Yet he taught us he didn't even qualify for the title good. Never mind very good. There's absolutely no way death could ever have been part of the original creative order. Death was introduced due to the defilement of creation by the contradiction of the Creator's righteousness, Adam and Eve's sin. We are specifically told that death came by sin and that death came by man, not God. Both man and beast were subjected to death, just like the law at Sinai, when God warned Israel to prepare for three days. He would come to them in the mountain and speak with them, but any man or animal touching that mountain would die, just like in the Garden of Eden. Just as touching not the unclean thing was a command during the First Kingdom Age, with its educational focus on sin condemnation and the necessity for righteous works, so touching the holy thing is an absolute command during the ecclesial age with its progressive educational focus on grace and imputed righteousness. We have to touch Jesus. We do this in baptism when we touch his dead body by joining him in the watery grave of baptism. We do this with the bread and the wine when we eat his flesh and drink his blood. We are not defiled by that touch. We're not unclean. We're made holy. Just as the direct touch of the altar of burnt offering and the direct touch of the flesh of the offerings under kingdom law uh, offered an automatic holiness status. We read this in uh, concerning the altar in Exodus 29, verse 37. We read, Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar, and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever touches the altar shall be holy. And also in Leviticus 6, uh, verse 18, it shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. Everyone that touches them shall be holy. And the prophet Haggai addresses this touching distinction in relation to Israel in connection with their delay in rebuilding the temple. We read in Haggai chapter 2, starting at verse 10. In the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, if, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. Yahweh highlights the touching difference. Direct contact is the only avenue for what is positive, but indirect contact is contagious in reference to what is negative. Therefore, all Israel was in an unacceptable state with God. Isn't that interesting? Positive requires direct contact and is not transferable. Holiness is not contagious. Holiness does not assign a new holiness host, unlike what is negative. 
Negative uncleanness is indirect and contagious. Uh, clearly, sin and divine uncleanness, divine unacceptability from a physical perspective, has a definite advantage. Just like our serpent-based thought process is our default reasoning. It always feels so right. Now let's really reinforce this principle of death, defeating death. It wasn't simply the person touching the dead that became unclean and needed to participate in a cleansing procedure. The priest who killed and burned the red heifer became unclean in doing so. Now remember, this red heifer represents our Messiah, Jesus Christ. That priest had to wash his clothes and bathe his body and was considered unclean until the next day, which would be that evening. Additionally, even the clean person who takes the ashes combined with running water and hyssop and spatters the unclean person on that third and seventh day outside the camp, even that originally clean person is transformed into unclean and also has to wash his clothes, wash his body, and be unclean until evening, that next day which began at sunset. Anyone who came in contact with the red heifer or the ashes became unclean by touching that red heifer, that symbol of our Messiah. So again, the question is why? My suggestion is to remember the, the constricting educational focus of kingdom law, which is the magnification of sin. Our education concerning sin, or whatever is a constitutes a contradiction of our Creator's righteousness, that's sin. Kingdom law could not save us. It can only condemn us, legitimately, righteously, but was incomplete for the saving process. We need to balance the equation with grace. However, we have to avoid the instinctive presumption that grace replaces sin condemnation. It definitely does not. Grace simply balances sin condemnation. This is why we have to be buried in a baptismal grave before we can rise out of that grave. This is why we have to eat the broken bread before the wine. The instinctive human heart-generated thought process prefers to presume that forgiveness is automatic and pretty close to effortless. But if grace completely eclipsed judgment, if grace eliminated the condemnation of sin, then why are the laws of the kingdom of God that were told magnify sin to be reapplied in the millennial kingdom? Why will circumcision and Sabbath observance and bloody altar offerings and temple worship and incense burning and Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Tabernacles going to be demanded of the entire world if grace somehow completely eliminates any consideration of our painful recognition of sin? We have to understand that the priests who touch the red heifer or its ashes the sin-condemning feature of our Messiah's sacrifice, were automatically unclean, divinely unacceptable, and had to wash their clothes and their body and wait for the new day for them to be clean, uh, divinely acceptable. We, would, we should think about what that means. Contemplate. Meditate on these things. It is natural for the human mind to think in terms of technicalities, oversimplifications. It's a defensive perspective. Our hearts minimalize issues to shield us from the enemy of the human heart, which is the conscience. The spiritual mind thinks in terms of principles and not technicalities. This is the goal our Creator has set for us, to think like him, so that we might be like him. He's looking for people who understand and appreciate him, his truths, his eternal principles, and his vision for creation. That is completely unnatural to us, as we were born with the serpent perspective. 
That's what is natural and instinctively right and comfortable to us. That's the default reasoning for the society in which we operate and communicate. That's why divine patterns should be considered, wondered about, meditated on. Well, how does this uncleanness by touch and its contagious nature have an application in our particular relationship with our Heavenly Father and our hope for salvation? This applies to the issue of separation. Uh, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14, in relation to this, this relationship between separation and touching not. Um, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Therefore, it only took a touch of a dead body, a bone, someone slain in the field, or even a grave, to automatically make someone divinely unacceptable to God, just like the Garden of Eden. We should be very careful in our considerations about separateness. This is not an inconsequential danger to us, the, this potential disrespecting of the principle of separation, of not touching that which is divinely unacceptable. We need to remember just how horrible and vile sin actually is to God. If we remember this, then perhaps we won't take for granted or treat as common the offer of grace and forgiveness that is afforded to the truly repentant. Well, let's consider the required features of the red heifer and consider how they apply to our Messiah and what truths and principles Yahweh is veiling in, this, in the parable of this ritual. So we have six features that are, divine, that, that are um, uh, defined. One is, this is a bovine, it's a, it's a cow. Secondly, that it has to be a female, being a heifer. Uh, third, childless, which of course is another feature of a heifer. Fourth, that it has to have red flesh. Five, that it can't have any blemish. And six, that this heifer has to have never had to have never served under a yoke. The six particular required features of this sacrificial animal is another confirmation of its sin offering status. There are six conditions for this sin offering, paralleling the six guilt-free sin offerings under kingdom law, mirroring the six sin offerings for guilty sin. Once again, highlighting the second acceptation of sin, sin in the flesh, for which we bear no guilt whatsoever. Now, a cow, uh, cattle, constituted the largest sacrificial animal. It was a clean animal. The bullock, of course a male cow, was used to represent the high priest as well as the nation in the context of the sin offerings of repentance. Therefore, a cow is an appropriate sacrificial symbol of the ultimate high priest, who served as a national sacrifice for sin. There were three conditions to satisfy an animal to be considered clean by divine standards, as determined from uh, Leviticus chapter 11. One was a split hoof. Uh, one was, uh, second was a cloven hoof, not simply split or in multiple uh, sections, but a particularly cloven hoof. And third, uh, that they chewed the cud. However, there was a fourth condition that was required of a clean animal that qualified it to be offered at the altar. It had to be a domesticated animal. The animal could not be wild. Wild animals that qualified for these three conditions could be hunted, killed, and eaten, but could never be brought to the altar. 
the blood of wild, clean animals uh, that had a split hoof, a cloven hoof, and chewed the cud. Uh, the blood of these animals had to be poured into the dust and covered with dust. Correspondingly, if someone killed a sacrificial animal and did not bring its blood to the altar, that person was to be forever ostracized from the community of the enlightened, from the ecclesia. Although we're not required to observe this ritual, we are required to observe the principles that are subtly being shadowed. Let's read in Leviticus 17, uh, verses 2 through 4, and then verse 13. We read, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof, and cover it with dust. End quote. The blood, the life, of a domesticated sacrificial animal is bound to the altar. The blood, the life, of a wild, undomesticated but clean animal is bound to the dust. This is a parable confirmation of the principle that the rebellious among those who are clean, which would be ourselves, the, the enlightened, that the lives of the rebellious within the enlightened community are bound to the curse of the dust. Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. However, the life, projected by the blood, of the clean but obedient, domesticated, is bound to the altar of burnt offering, which Paul interprets for us as representing our Messiah. So there were three conditions for determining a clean animal, but a fourth condition for qualifying that animal for associating it with the altar. It couldn't be wild. It had to be a domesticated animal, an obedient animal, not rebellious. Please remember in the back of your mind this issue of a pattern of three within a pattern of four. It is monumentally significant in the context of the complete plan for creation. Now, male calves, bullocks, were certainly welcome at the Christ altar, at the bronze altar of burnt offering. A bullock uh, constituted the sin offering for the high priest, and also for the nation. But the red heifer had to be just that, a heifer, a female. Why? And not just a female, but a female that had never given birth, a heifer. The primary answer is that this was the avenue for our Messiah to possess the capacity to defeat death through death by break breaking the power of sin in his body. The subject of how Jesus bore sin on the cross and on what basis sin was there on that cross has been a traditional stumbling block for Bible commentators and even those within the community of the enlightened since Christ was crucified. One aspect of this question has been the basis of how the benefits of Christ's sacrifice are extended to us. Is it a question of substitution or representation? Did Jesus die instead of us or simply for us as an extension of dying initially for himself? This was the basis of the problem with the Christadelphian renunciationists from the 1800s. It was and still is the problem with the difference uh, between the amended and unamended Christadelphians and is at the core of the recent revival of the concept of clean flesh within our amended fellowship where the guilt-free physical aspect of sin is being denied, as in the recent book on understanding the atonement that was published in our community, sadly. The fact is that the basis by which our Messiah bore sin was determined at his birth, and not his death. Jesus was made sin by being born from a woman who coincidentally had never given birth before. 
exactly mirroring the terms of the red heifer, the sin offering for the cleansing from death. Let's just look at how this is expressed by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. We read, For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This 21st verse actually directly addresses five of the six required features of the red heifer sin offering for, for the cleansing from death. Our Messiah was made sin at his birth, not his death. The Virgin Mary, a woman from whom no child had been born, was impregnated by the Holy Spirit to give birth to Jesus, the ultimate red heifer, the antitypical red heifer. However, as Job tells us, no one can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing. Therefore, Jesus was born with the same unclean, cursed human nature as his mother, with the same embedded serpent philosophy, what scripture calls sin, as demonstrated in the required red flesh of the heifer, that red skin, that red flesh. One confirmation of this would be noting that Mary, appropriately, gave a sin offering for herself for giving birth to Jesus. And we read about in Luke 2, verses 22 to 24. We compare that to Leviticus 12 and verse 8. In reference to our confidence in the immortal human nature of Jesus, as opposed to the apostate presumption of an immortal being disguising himself in a mortal body, being, mortal body this sin offering by Mary for giving birth to Jesus is absolute proof that Jesus was not God. If Jesus were an immortal and therefore perfectly holy and right, then on what basis would it have been appropriate for Mary to give a sin offering just for being a portal for an immortal being to put on a mortal body disguise and pretend to be born? Jesus was made sin at his birth, not his death by a female who had not given birth previously, just like the required female status of the red heifer, who could not have previously given birth and whose flesh had to be red. Just like God told Adam and Eve, it would be specifically the seed of the woman that would defeat the serpent, as we're told in Genesis 3 and 15. That seed produced from the woman would, be, would not be generated from man, but from God. Therefore, he would be the seed of the woman. The avenue by which Jesus was made sin, inheriting the same cursed human nature we do with our default thought process, being self-centered and not God-centered. Human nature is called sin because it was both the direct result of Adam and Eve's sin and also that human nature is the engine for contradictions to our Creator's righteousness, the cause of guilty sin. Let's just read that verse in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 one more time. For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We noted that at least five of the six required features of the red heifer are addressed in this particular verse. The process by which Jesus was made sin can be seen in the red heifer requirements of being female, never having previously given birth, and the completely red flesh, sin in the flesh, red flesh of the animal, indicating that sinful flesh. However, there also could not be a single blemish in this animal, projecting the understanding expressed in this 21st verse that Jesus knew no sin. Despite the fact that he was made sin, Jesus never performed any sin. He never allowed that sin-prone flesh to actually conceive guilty sin. He was blemishless, which is also confirmed in the requirement that the red heifer could never have served under a yoke, indicating how our antitypical red heifer, our Messiah, would never serve sin at any time. We're exhorted to change our master at baptism, to no longer serve sin, to no longer be yoked 
to sin. To shift our natural allegiance from sin to the unnatural allegiance to the Spirit. Our Messiah never, ever served sin. He never served under the yoke. And therefore, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, he knew or experienced no performance sin, despite being made sin at his birth just like us. Uh, similarly, we read in Hebrews 9, uh, starting in verse 25, Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered, uh, entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Although Jesus came the first time with sin, he comes the second time without sin. The sin he came with the first time was the human nature he was born with, from an unclean, on the basis of sin nature, childless female, and exactly the pattern indicated by the red heifer. Jesus defeated that sin, crushing the serpent's head underfoot by being blemish-free, never serving under the yoke of sin, and then dying violently on the cross to execute the cause of sin, which was nakedly exposed by the blemish-free, transgression-free body of Jesus that had never served under sin's yoke. Jesus declared the righteousness of his Father, that sin deserves death, and that his Father's judgment in Eden was, is, and always will be right in demanding death for sin. Jesus put the cause of sin to death. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He defeated death through death in exactly the pattern the red heifer ritual demonstrates. On the basis of Christ's antitypical ashes, we can be cleansed from the defilement of death. This is why we're baptized into Christ's death. This is why we eat the bread of his broken body, where the power of sin was broken, but not a single bone was broken, and why we drink his blood. We have to understand how and why our Messiah had to die in order to demonstrate that our Creator's judgment of death for sin was right. This is what everything is all about. Understanding and appreciating the rightness of our Creator, so that we might participate in the benefits of His eternal truths and principles, His rightness, His righteousness. This isn't all about us. The primary reason Jesus had to die was not so that we could be forgiven of our sins, as so many Christadelphians tell us. The primary reason was to validate his Father's righteousness. Our forgiveness is just a side benefit. We're not the main event. We're not the center ring that is Yahweh. That red cow had to be a heifer a female that had never given birth. As we've observed, this confirms the path by which our Messiah would bear sin, being born of a virgin. But there's more to this, as the red heifer is a ritual parable of Jesus Christ himself. In what context? Why should the heifer be childless upon its sacrificial execution? This heifer representing Jesus Christ. That's because it's on the basis of the death of Jesus that he has the capacity to have children. It is on the basis of his death that Jesus qualifies for the title he's given in Isaiah 9 and verse 6 of being an everlasting father. Uh, we read in that uh, verse, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Another verse in Isaiah validating this understanding that's projected by the heifer status would be Isaiah 53, verse 10, where we read, we read, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He's put him to grief. 
When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. End quote. It's on the basis of our Messiah making his soul, his life, an offering for sin, by which he will see his seed, his descendants, his children. Paul expresses the same thought in this way. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 22. For is in, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Christ is the firstfruits in the grave, having broken the power of sin and death, and then arising from that the grave to live forever. Those that are Christ, those that belong to Christ, will experience this rebirth, this born-again experience, at his coming. These are the two stages of the red heifer ritual. The first is the burning to ashes of the red heifer, the red cedar, the scarlet, the hyssop, indicating the sacrificial death of our Messiah. The second stage is the spattering of the ashes with running water onto the individuals defiled by death. This reflects those that belong to Christ, his seed. They will be reborn again at his coming. This is another reason why the ritual called for a red heifer. It was only through the sacrificial death of the antitypical red heifer that Jesus would have children. On the basis of both the virgin status of Christ's mother, the basis by which Jesus was made sin at his birth, and the fact that Jesus would only become a father on the basis of his sacrificial death. The heifer status for this kingdom of God ritual was absolutely necessary. Let's ask about the last three conditions for this sacrificial animal. The, the red flesh, its unblemished status, and having never served under the yoke. Just like the first three conditions, these three have to also be considered under the umbrella theme of sin condemnation. We've noted how they're re they related to 1 Corinthians 5 and 21, but now let's prove how these features relate to the red heifer being a sin offering. The red flesh, of course, is an absolutely perfect portrait for the principle of sin in the flesh. Red flesh. This is the guilt-free second category of sin, human nature, the producer of congressional, uh, transgressional sin. Most, if not all of us, are probably aware of how the color red is consistently associated with sin throughout Scripture. Oh, for example, <clears throat> Isaiah 1 and 18, where we read, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And of course, we also have the, the allegorical red dragon referenced in Revelation uh, be referring to the principle of aggregate sin expressed politically, which is why the application of the dragon can shift politically several times, uh, although maintaining a Roman association at every phase. Red is highly emphasized in this red heifer sin offering. Let's notice verses 5 and 6 of uh, Numbers 19. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin, her flesh, her blood, with her dung shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it in the midst of the burning of the heifer. So we see uh, red skin, uh, red red components, the, uh, the red hide, the red flesh, the red blood. Uh, and then we have a non-red item, the dung. And then we have the, uh, the four incineration components, uh, being the red cedar, the red clod, the red heifer, and the hyssop, which doesn't necessarily have to be red and is not identified as red. So six red items out of the eight are being identified. As we've already noted, six is the number of the curse of sin and death. Eight is the number of immortality, and therefore directly associated with our Savior many times and in many different ways, such as the six Greek letters in the name of our Savior Jesus that add up to 888 which is a shadow prophecy of the three immortalization events our Creator has planned when mortality is covered with immortality, when six becomes eight on three occasions. The 
red heifer ritual was a sacrifice for the physical cleansing from sin. That sin association is being subtly highlighted all through the features of this offering. The unblemished status and the requirement that the heifer could never have served under the yoke present the transgression-free status of Jesus at the point of his death. He had no blemishes. His entire life had absolutely no contradictions to his father's righteousness. This feature was absolutely essential for the process by which our Messiah could overcome the defilement of death on the basis of his own death. Without a complete absence of any blemishes, or as Paul said, being without sin, referring exclusively to guilty sin, without that complete absence of guilty sin, then the cause of sin would remain insulated, as it does in our deaths. The head of the serpent would not have been endangered. That blemish-free and unyoked status of our Messiah was absolutely essential for the defeat of death through his death, exactly mirroring the requirements of the red heifer sin offering for cleansing from the def physical defilement of sin. We've reviewed the six required conditions that had to be satisfied for the offering to be effective. In our next class, we'll address why it was the appointed high priest, why the appointed high priest was not assigned the responsibility for performing this red heifer ritual, as well as some other questions such as the blood spattering and the third and seventh day applications of the red heifer ashes uh, that offer not only a fascinating prophecy, but presents a unique pattern that is repeated in both the Old and New Testaments.